Welcome, everyone. Um, we've, got, we've got a brilliant online Q and R today uh, with drama artist, uh, possibly polymath, um, Sarathi Kovar, um, who's kindly agreed to join us. And we're going to talk about you know sort of music, um, art, life. You know, hopefully get quite philosophical as well. So I suppose the first question, um, uh, Sarathi, is how did you get into music? What was mm. what was that route? Yeah, I mean. Um... I sort of grew up in a place called Ahmedabad, which is in uh, India, sort of the western half of India. Mm -hmm. And um, both my parents uh, sing sort of semi-professionally uh, Indian classical music, Hindustani classical music. So there was a lot of music around in the house. They used to be singing all the time, you know, practicing. And um, I was encouraged from a very early age to just kind of pick up an instrument and play. So. I kind of naturally gravitated towards the tabla when I was about eight um, and started taking lessons, you know, as you do as a kid, like mm. one of the few, th one of the many things that you're kind of doing. So it was never really something I focused on too much, mm -hmm. um, almost up to the age of 17. Um, I kind of just played. It was like a hobby, you know, yeah, that yeah. You do in the evenings, you'd go to your teacher's, you know, uh, house and you'd learn a little bit. And I didn't really give it much attention. And so when I was 17, I looked up and I realized that I had this ability already, you know, because as a child, you're picking up and imbibing so much. And the great thing about learning an instrument, as all we all know, as, as, as someone at that age, is that you don't really consciously have to put in the work. Um, you know, so much of it just comes naturally mm -hmm. and you develop technique and an ability to kind of understand rhythm without having to consciously think about it basically. Um, and so I was lucky, honestly, that I kind of kept it up and um, started playing the drum kit sort of alongside the tabla since I was about 15. Mm. So much later, really. Um, and then sort of hand in hand, was trying to play drum kit and tabla sort of throughout. I mean, it's still I'm crying, basically. So it's like, yeah, that's how it all began. But yeah, I love I mean, that's interesting. We talk about that when you're a child, that when you when you pick something up. Um, I was talking to um, a therapist, who's a music therapist, and he said that there's a brilliant like transition that happens in life. When you when you begin playing music, um, uh, you're kind of unaware of your incompetency, but you have so much confidence, so much instinct, it kind of carries you forward. And and the, then what ha then happens is like the more you learn the more you realize that you don't know yeah. so much and you become quite conscious of your incompetency and there's a weird period in the middle where when you're learning you're very self-conscious in your playing mm -hmm. and we're always trying to get back to that stage of like instinctive and melodic yeah. and rhythmic understanding yeah i mean it's a constant you know struggle and battle like you say like when i teach now younger students uh, when i do private lessons with kids who just go in like they just sort of don't think and they, they like you say there's just no sort of sense of um yeah there's no sort of there's a complete lack of awareness of what they're doing so they have that kind of courage to just make decisions and yeah jump into something which is really like the best way to learn yeah and yeah we've got so much unlearning to do basically as adults to try and get to that. And, you know, it's basically close to impossible to be that kid again, but, you know, you're trying in many ways to kind of try and be as instinctive as possible in your own playing, but in your own learning and teaching and everything. Yeah. But yeah. Wow. But fantastic. And so obviously, so you've studied it like Indian classical music um, and, you know, you, and you have a master's degree in music performance. How did you find that experience and, how would you say that it's come to support you, uh, you know, as, as an aspiring musician, how those two things sort of come together? So I think what's interesting for me to think about anyway, is that like I did learn music in two very different ways. So mm -hmm. my tabla playing and so Indian classical playing was very much with a single teacher at any given point of time, like going to their house, learning one-on-one -on -one lessons or group lessons, but in a very kind of non conservatory style sort of informal learning environment. Mm. Whereas my drum playing, kit playing is completely the opposite. And it's the result of a lot of academic training and a lot of sort of institutionalized structural kind of programs, you know. Mm. Um, and I find that quite interesting that like I've been kind of exposed to both those two modes of learning. And in a way, both those modes of learning have really shaped the way I approach those, those instruments. Mm -hmm. you know, differently. So I think 
having said that what i love about both kind of modes of learning is that kind of sense of uh, community that i really enjoyed while i was at music school you know uh. whether it was like in my teacher's house or whether it was in a classroom full of other kids you know very much like an icmp kind of learning environment um it really helped to help people around me uh pursuing the same thing it just kind of really encouraged me motivated me you're kind of in that headspace throughout the day and i think i find that really really like positive and very conducive to kind of like learning that's interesting so that distinction between um playing in a more intimate environment and playing in a, in a more structured like formalized academic setting i mean w- w- would you say what what are the skills that you've gained from studying in that more academic formal environment that you might not yeah, have had I mean, without I, it yeah i think the most important thing is that i've learned a sense of structure and like there was a discipline that was easy to kind of take up because your day is kind of laid out like if you're mm. studying an instrument and you're breaking things down into for example technique and concepts and learning songs or whatever it is you can really kind of like compartmentalize all these different things mm. and in a way it makes it easier to kind of get through your day and say look like i'm going to spend one hour on technique one hour on this one hour on that whereas if you're with your tabla teacher you're literally spending 3 hours just playing or listening to him and it's so much more like imbibing information and trying to mimic that person so that's another thing actually i haven't mentioned but i think through the informal environment you end up sounding like your teacher a lot more that's so interesting so is it almost like is it almost like the kind of um master apprentice um Amazing, sort of yeah. roles when you're say like studying when you're learning carpentry or something it's a very specific craft and you learn with a maestro you know and you exactly. imitate and there's such a strong emphasis on mimicking your your teacher because he's your only reference in terms of how to play so you're watching him or her and you're trying to do what they're doing and you know a lot of times like our my classes after a certain level once i got to a level where i could play you know so so sort of intermediate to advanced level my tabla classes would just be me and my teacher playing together and he would do something and i'd try to copy him and then he'd do something else and i'd try to copy him and it would get to a level where he would do something and i wouldn't be able to kind of match him because it was just too complicated or just a step too far for me and then right. i had to stop but that was how like there was very little communication in terms of actual words said you know it was right. a lot of just imbibing and learning and that was something i was told from very early age like don't question your teacher take in as much as you can ask all your questions after the session is done right which was a very you know in a sense it irrationally doesn't make much sense and it's also very antithetical to what you're taught in an institution in the sense that you're meant to kind of you know raise your hand and ask questions whenever there's a problem whenever you kind of lose track of what your teacher is saying you know stop anyone midway through a lesson whereas when you're learning from your teacher in a in more indian classical style you're just meant to go with the flow for however long and then afterwards you can take notes you can write stuff down but you're just there and trying to take in as much orally um as you can so it's a very different skill in a way you know to like kind of learn that way as well mm. that's yeah. so interesting i i didn't realize i didn't realize that it was like that and that and as you say it's a completely different learning skill and it's yeah. a life skill that is is so useful if you if you have sharpened that part of your brain and and you can observe absorb and then repeat you know that that's a skill in itself yeah i think it's really i'm i'm truly like i feel very lucky for having done that and this so i could mm. kind of see the difference in kind of modes of learning and i think both have their positives and negatives you know it also then ultimately comes down to you and your personality and how you kind of cope with certain environments like some people uh, you know cope better when they're told exactly what to do every 2 yeah. minutes but yeah. some people are quite happy to have that kind of freedom and like just express themselves and not mm-hmm. have that much kind of uh, instruction and can think about things later so it also very much comes down to you know the individual teacher and student really great and so what then precipitated the the transition or the inclusion of the western drum kit and how would you say that your training uh, on the tabla has as inform that or influence that if it has at all hmm 
I mean, I kind of grew up listening to a lot of rock and roll, really. I listened to a lot of The Doors. I listened to mm-hmm. a lot of Jimi Hendrix and Beatles. And so I always wanted to play the drums. I didn't really want to play the tabla. You know, the tabla was something that I'd kind of been playing. And, you know, my parents studied classical music. Indian classical music was very much something that my parents liked. So mm-hmm. as a young kind of adolescent teenager, it was something that I kind of didn't want to have any thing to do with really you know mm-hmm. I, I, I was listening to stuff from the 60s i was listening to janis joplin and i was listening to hendrix and like you know, that was the kind of stuff i wanted to play like on the drums and then slowly i kind of started listening to blues and jazz and you know coming across these amazing drummers people like art blakey and like tony williams and i'm like oh God, what is what's going on like, you know and then i wanted to kind of play and so once I got my hands on a drum kit for the first time, you know, I, I was like very focused on then just playing the drums. And um, my tabla kind of took a back seat for a few years, you know. Um, and ex- I kind of exclusively then sort of played the drum kit and the tabla until I was about 22, 23, but never really trying to mix the two. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted to be a really good drummer. I wanted to be a good tabla player, but I didn't really think about kind of consciously merging the two or mixing both styles or anything like that. Right. Um, Which was really handy, I think, because I got to a point where I got quite deep into both traditions of music, you know, Um, and I spent a lot of time studying jazz, a lot of time studying Indian classical music, which is kind of why I'm at a point today where now things just kind of happen organically, you know, Uh both kind of genres of music just inform each other without me having to consciously think about what section of this is influencing this? Is this particular rhythm from this? Is it, you know, how is it making an impression on how I'm playing the drums or vice versa? So again, like it's, it's, yeah, it's something that now comes very naturally because I've spent time learning both those genres of music, you know? And, and would you say that's something that's happened as well? I mean, I suppose like since moving to London, you played with, you know, um, Carl Berger, Kamazi Washington, uh, Shibaka ha- um, uh uh, Hutchins, um, on in the jazz scene, uh, the jazz scene is is you know famously a scene that's pulling from all kinds of different areas. Um, did you find that a scene an, an easy scene to sort of like to break into? You know, from a networking point of view, um, and what was that experience like for you in order to sort of like present yourself as somebody who had this slightly left of center approach to rhythm? Mm. I kind of just found myself in it. To be honest, I didn't really think about trying to join the jazz scene. You know, mm. it was um, I was a big fan. Obviously, I've been listening to a lot of jazz, um, but not necessarily jazz that was happening from the UK. You know, I was listening to the greats and I'd like and as a as a 22, 23 year old in my first couple of years here in London, I'd try and, you know, save up and go to Ronnie's. I'd go to Pizza Express um, Jazz Club, try and catch as much stuff, you know, try and see all the legends that I'd kind of grew up listening to, like from Dave Weckl to Billy Cobham to like, you know, everyone like mm-hmm. Herbie Hancock, whoever came to town, I'd be there. But what ended up happening is that I um, applied for a, um, a fellowship or a scholarship uh, through the Steve Reed Foundation, which is something that's run by, um, it's a foundation run by Charles Peterson and uh, Kieran Hebden, who's a fortet and floating points are all trustees on the organization. And it's for emerging right. musicians um, to kind of try and take their career to the next level, you know, who needed yeah. that boost, who don't have that kind of network in place. You know, as me, like as a first generational immigrant, like I left all my networks back in India. I didn't know anyone, you know, you only knew who you knew from music school and that's it. Yeah. Um, and largely a lot, you know, maybe about 80% of my class that was in music school with me ended up going back to where they came from, you know. 80%? I think so, yeah, about 80%. Wow. And I mean, wow. it's staggering. I mean, the amount of people who, you know, kind of try and sort of don't do it after a couple of years, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, because you think about the number of people who also come out of these kind of institutions every year and you think, oh my God, there's like, you know, I was in a class of 20 drummers and there was like seven classes all doing diplomas in yeah. contemporary music. So there's like 80, 90 drummers, like where do they all go? Where, where's, you know, where's the opportunity? Anyway, I'm sort of, yeah, yeah. that's another yeah. thing, <laughs> it's tangent. But um, 
basically that's how i kind of found myself um interacting with people like giles mm -hmm. and um i had come to them with an idea of making my first debut album in 2016 um which kind of combined a lot of indian folk music with jazz mm -hmm. um and they took to it really well they wanted me to do it so i got a lot of support and mentorship from them and because i had their support i kind of found myself then talking to labels and i got signed by ninja tune and i put my first uh, album out on them on and i kind of then just found myself in this jazz world you know the uk jazz scene and that was the time when 2016 17 18 when the uk jazz scene all these young kids coming out and playing you know moses boyd ezra collective dubai garcia shubaka hutchings sons of kemet all these people were coming out and like and i kind of joined that sort of exodus in a way you know yeah. um and i was very lucky i think timing is a huge thing where you know i happen to be making the kind of music that i'm making very left of center like you said but also making the kind of music that no one else was making in the jazz scene because i had my kind of indian influences you know mm. and nobody else had that people were taking stuff from the caribbean from sound system culture mm. you know from grime from dubstep from garage and combining it with jazz and afrobeat all the stuff but i kind of came at it from an angle where i was like okay you know i love jazz i love indian classical music this is who i am i've grown up playing the tabla and the drums how do i kind of make this happen for myself and it's funny because look, looking back on it you know when i'm hearing you talking um Indian classical music seems on paper like the most obvious go-to place for jazz or, or from a mathematical point of view yeah. when you get deep into the kind of like Carnatic tradition and you look at the and I've, you know, I've got other friends who are who are drummers and you know when they make these videos online where two of them will be like trading turns on like on, on, a, on, a, on a riff that might go on for like 10 minutes and you're like yeah. this is incredible yeah absolutely incredible um it, it it makes jazz look like ba like standard Western jazz. It makes it look like fifties rock and roll or something. You know? sure. It's just I mean, like so jazz complex. Indian classical music and jazz have so much in common from mm. an improvisatory standpoint as well. You know, both are based in this idea of having kind of loose frameworks within which people improvise in. You know, mm. Mm. essentially that's what Indian classical music does, and that's what jazz does. You know, um, so in a way, like you say, it's a very obvious. Uh, fusion to be made and you know through the 60s 70s 80s so many jazzers went looking east you know from coltrane to miles davis to alice coltrane pharaoh sanders don cherry you know all these people looked eastwards yeah. for inspiration for like just to study different scales to see different kinds of rhythms that were happening and uh, there was a lot of exchange mm. and uh, for me kind of it became about like, what can I contribute to that exchange? But in 2018, 19, 2020, you know, I'm somebody who's, uh, yeah, I've grown up with a different kind, a set of influences. Um, um, so yeah, that's, that's where I'm at now. <laughs> and, you know, I feel, you know, that when you came to London, you brought with you that, se that sense of inquiry and curiosity that, um, travelers, you know, expats, you know, refugees, however you might term it, that the people who've journeyed somewhere, almost pilgrimage somewhere to study, you've got that sense of curiosity. And actually that's, that's really like lit the way for you. I mean, what advice would you give to people, you know, in the first few weeks of their course, and they might not have come as far as India. They may have only come from say the North of England or something or, or Italy, but for you, what do you feel is really important to do when you first arrive, you know, first few weeks, of trying to get your bearings what do you think is important i think the main thing is like like you said people coming from different parts of the world they might not be coming from as far away as india but somebody from manchester or somebody from bradford even whatever london is a special place yeah. and you need to try and maximize your time here like wherever you're from I guarantee you, you haven't come from a place like London, you know, unless you're from New York or something. You know? mm. I mean, there's so much culture. There's so much to learn from the city. And one of the reasons I wanted to move to London to study music was not necessarily for the music school itself, but I knew I wanted to be in London. You know, I wanted to be able to kind of interact with other musicians, check out other music. And the kind of exposure I got from just being in the city, <coughs> sorry, has had a massive impact on the way I think about music, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I think one of the main things I would say is, you know, don't go into your little bubble of music school. 
Mm-hmm. Try and stay really open and check out as much music. I know it's just silly to say this right now because of COVID, but like, you know, try and check out as much music as you can. Mm. Um, try and go to gigs, try and go to jams, just meet people, talk about music with people outside of music school, see how people are making music who've never had any training in music, but are still professional mm-hmm. musicians. They'll give you a different sense of how you know music works for them. I think that's one of the main things I would say. And then B, what was really important, I think, at the level where if you're going to music school right now is to just put in the hours, mm. put in the hours and practice, mm. just practice, you know, because you're not going to get this kind of chance to practice. I'm telling you, like when you're like me in your early 30s, like you'll have other stuff to do. Mm. And, you know, you'll be maybe further ahead in your career where maybe your priorities have changed, you know, mm. Um I think put in the hours and I think I was very lucky again, you know, I spent a lot of time in the practice booths, just kind of working on my technique and jobs. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think, I think of that time very fondly now. Mm. Um, and I kind of say that to people like, you know, put in the hours and uh, that's why you're at music school and have fun with it. You know, it's music ultimately, like don't treat it like any other kind of academic uh, uh yeah, any other sort of academic uh, 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 work, really, you know, yeah. because end of the day, you got into music to kind of have fun as well. Nobody gets into music to to study, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. No. And so, I mean, I mean, that's great advice. And actually, all established, you know, uh, musicians and artists that, that I speak to always, you know, actually give that advice. Um it's that it's that really fine balance between knowing why you've gone somewhere, having the discipline to know why you've gone there, to remind yourself of that, but to not beat yourself with a stick about it, you know, because exactly. um, there'll always be somebody who never leaves the practice room, you know, who never goes to a gig because they just have to get, get those ten thousand hours in, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's you know that's obviously that's a whole separate conversation about no, you're how right. we get I that think- balance. You're right. It's a, such a very fine balance. And, you know, you could be in a practice room for six hours a day and then feel guilty about not going and checking out that gig because yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something different there. And I think it's about that's where surrounding yourself with people and mates who are kind of into different things really helps because then you kind of don't lose perspective. You know, mm. I think mm. if you're just there alone in a room, it might feel like you're doing the right thing. But I know so many drummers, for example, who've spent hours practicing their technique but haven't put a single piece of music out in the last 10 years you know yeah wow and wow you you wonder like what you, know, you you question the motivations like why have you done this like what what is the point of practice if it's yeah. not to create music at the yeah. end of the day so anyway but um like you say it's a fine balance and you know uh, often these this kind of advice can seem uh like it's going in two different directions of the same coin, you know, yeah, uh, two yeah. sides of the same coin, but uh, equally both are important, like checking out music and practicing. So, yeah. And, you know, I suppose, you know, you've, you've, you've already done so much. I mean, you know, you not only work with and for other musicians, you know, but you know, you're you know, a fully fledged artist uh, in your own right. And, when speaking to you know aspiring artists other artists um you know certainly younger artists not necessarily in age but maybe just an experience what do you think are the key skills they, they should now be developing or thinking about um during their studies and you know if, if for an artist in today's music industry what do you think are, are the key skills uh, as they might have differed or changed over the years Mm. I think the most important thing is to kind of try and develop your own style and voice through all this, because often if you're learning music through an institution, it can feel often, at least I felt, this is my personal opinion, but I felt like I was sometimes in a kind of factory line Mm. of like just churning out session musicians. Mm. Like Mm. at the end of two years of uh, my training, everyone sounded the same. Yeah, because we'd all basically practice the same way. We'd learn, we'd listen to the same music for two years. And one of my teachers told me this uh, great piece of advice. He says, like, if you, <laughs> it's a very cynical way to put it, but it was funny at the time. And he said that you know, if after two years of music school, you still feel like playing music, then you've succeeded somehow. <laughs> because sometimes, you know, music school can really drain yeah. drain you. you know? yeah, yeah. And I think it's important to remember at the end of the day that. Music's still got to be fun. And the way to find your own voice 
in a time where you're being judged academically and by your peers in a very narrow sense of how to play mm. and how to kind of perform and be creative even you know mm. Mm. it's it's important to not lose sight of the fact that there's thousands of ways to play and there's thousands of ways to think about music yeah, so very true. it's yeah. great that you know people are doing a very kind of set way of playing because you do need to learn a certain discipline and style equally don't take it too seriously you know and try and develop whatever it is that you want to say i almost say to a lot of people like don't try and be session musicians because mm-hmm. the reality is session musicians aren't people who are like jack of all trades like people hire people because they like their specific sound that they've developed over years and years of training i get work as a session musician because of my indian and jazz kind of backgrounds not because i'm good at playing a hip hop beat and an r and b thing and a little bit of blues and a little bit of jazz that's never going to happen you know mm. Mm. you have to specialize you yeah. have to spe- everyone specializes and so don't fall for that trap of trying to play everything it's great to play everything to learn a little bit mm. and the foundations need to be clear but after that try and develop your own voice that's yeah. key for me that's that's brilliant brilliant advice i mean that and that again that really echoes what you know, you speak to anyone um who's having any success with art yeah across across the spectrum and it's like be yourself everybody else is taken you know like find yeah. your voice and you know that's that's what that's what we're looking for i mean do, do you find it challenging combining your work as a as a session musician as, as a collaborator um with your solo artistic output is there any friction there not really i feel like actually my solo output has helped my session work like in a way my solo work has helped me build my portfolio mm-hmm. and helped me like help other people see me for who i am you know mm-hmm. other people now can see the kind of work that i make and be like ah oh, okay so this is who he is and like my voice is now more clear as a musician mm-hmm. so because i actually do more solo work or i'm a band leader I actually get booked for more session work because people know what I can bring to a project. Mm-hmm. You know, so in a way they both work in tandem. Like I think if I'd spent more time trying to be a session musician, I would have actually got less work. If that makes sense. That's really interesting. You know. Wow. And the yeah. last thing I wanted to say about like, you know, in terms of giving advice is that I think a lot of people um coming out of music school and myself included, you know, f- uh it can be overwhelming and the kind of music industry in london is you know super competitive and you can feel like there's no way you're going to make it but i think it's important to remember that there's enough room for everyone you know yeah, yeah and yeah. there is a way to make it like don't in 6 months kind of give up because you think it's not happened you're still doing your kind of day job and it's not be stubborn you know mm-hmm. and it'll work out i think like you yeah. got to just kind of keep trying and i get it it's it's super hard for a lot of people and you might not even have the money to be able to kind of stay in london after music school or for whatever reason you know um but i think there's a certain amount of like just not giving in and kind of trying to make it and not being overwhelmed by the situation mm. uh, it's very easy to get overwhelmed in a place like london because mm. there's just so many of us you know yeah yeah wonderful i'm and i really want to talk about um your your live album uh my east is your west um can you just talk to us about the ideas that you had when you know you you when you created this project um how it came together um yeah i'm just keen to just l- learn more about, about mm. that yeah we kind of briefly touched upon the the fact that you know a lot of uh, jazzers in the 70s and 80s were, were looking eastwards for mm. inspiration and kind of that's where the idea of the album came from because when somebody talks about the term indo jazz you know indian classical music and jazz one often thinks of people like alice coltrane and like um, yeah ferro sanders uh, mm. people who kind of dabbled in a lot of indian music and sure yeah. i'm a big fan of all these people i love their music and like i grew up listening to it and i still think it's amazing music equally while i was listening to a lot of this music growing up there was always certain things in their music that kind of made me uncomfortable for example mm-hmm. they'd be like a really badly played tabla 
on like a Joe Henderson record or an Alice Coltrane yeah. record, or they would be like a really out of tune sitar. Yeah. And it made me wonder, was like, why is this happening? You know, all these people are obviously very competent jazz musicians who can tell, you know, when something's not in tune or, you know, whatever. but it comes down to this idea of tokenism, you know, and yeah. having just having a little bit of sitar in your music and have a little bit of tabla without really paying attention to what these instruments and what the tradition behind these instruments is, you know, and not basically not giving it enough respect mm. comes down to really. Mm. Um, so what I wanted to do was kind of set the rebalance the scales is what I kind of thought about it as where I wanted to do an in Indian jazz record where I had, you know, five Indian classical musicians, five jazz musicians so that, both those play all those players can express themselves freely and equally more importantly you know mm -hmm. so it's not overloaded with jazzers it's not overloaded with indian classical musicians either i thought that you know we're in a time now when we recorded it in 2018 where it was time that that kind of situation is possible mm -hmm. from a live environment where we could have like you know um, 10 people on stage half and half Mm. And also the conversation has gone far beyond, um, you know, people have a much better understanding of what Indian music is now. Mm. People, even in India, people have a much stronger understanding of what jazz is, for example, you know, just because of the internet and so many people study and the, the, the kind of cross-cultural, uh, you know, uh, cross-cultural meetings are, are far more and people have just a better understanding. So I thought in a way to have an album that reflects that, and this current and more contemporary sounding uh, would be a good idea. And so we approached this organization called the Church of Sound, who basically put on concerts in a church in Clapton, uh, sort of North London. Mm -hmm. And um, we did this show that lasted like three, three and a half hours. And we basically recorded the whole thing and uh, put it out on vinyl as Brilliant. a release. Yeah. So it's it was a brilliant show. Uh, I have really, really fond memories of the show itself. And I think in a way, the recording really captured that kind of liveness uh, as well. Because um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of mistakes, don't get me wrong. It's, it's, there's parts of that where I would have played it very differently if, you know, if it was a studio thing. But in a way, it was more about capturing that moment in time and the spontaneity that existed and the kind of interaction between the players. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, yeah, that's what we managed to do. It's such a huge undertaking. I mean, uh, it's one thing playing the gig, you know, but it's another thing conceptualizing it and bringing the players together, you know, and, and kind of really like marshalling all those different skills. Yeah. I mean, uh, th you, you must have had moments in your career where you've struggled, you've had doubt. I mean, how, how have you overcome those moments? And, you know, if you were talking to a younger student who's, say, struggling with their studies or struggling with an aspect and that they, they want to give up, you know, what, what would you say to them or to your younger self? I think I would say that, like, it's not as lonely as it seems. Like I said before, like, it's very easy to get overwhelmed in this environment because you can feel like the whole world is against you. You know, as a freelance musician, you're not getting paid every day, you know, Sometimes people aren't listening to your music. You start questioning whether your music's any good. Um, you don't get called for that one gig. You get some another drummer, another musician gets called instead of you. Self-doubt can be a huge thing. And, you know, you've got to have a kind of thick skin at some level to be able to survive almost. But I think it's important to say that let yourself have those feelings, but also know that you're not alone. You know, there's lots of people who go through this all the time and mm -hmm. having like those support networks are really, really important. Just having other friends who you can call. I've really, uh, you know, I've greatly kind of um, helped. What's helped me is having friends outside of music. You know, because mm -hmm. I think as musicians, we can get so caught up with like just being in our bubble of musicians and the music world. Uh, you forget that, you know, there's people doing other things in this world that uh, can be equally inspiring. And um, almost having those weekends where I'm not thinking music mm -hmm. is, is really, really healthy for me, you know. Oh, 100%. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, I think I would tell my younger self that you know, just be stubborn. Like I said, like it'll pay off in the end if you're doing it for the right reasons, you know, yeah. Yeah. if you're doing it to stay creative and like you have something to say and you want to say it, um, 
then it'll it'll be fine it should it should work out basically and that makes so much sense when you think about going back to what you said earlier about you know what's your motivation for this well why are you doing this you know yeah. have you thought it through fully in why are you in this practice room because there are lots of aspects of making music that are so lonely yeah and when you put all those lonely bits together you think what, what's the point of doing any of this you know yeah, yeah. but um, as you say when you zoom out and you have a you've thought the whole thing through you just have to sort of remind yourself of those. It things. takes time, you know, and I think no one's ever equipped to, uh, no one ever tells you how lonely it's going to be no. either, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're in music school, it's great. Um, you have people around you, you go to class every day. And then once you're done, suddenly it could just be you on your sofa, you know, just like doing paradiddles, thinking, oh, okay, I'm going to get a call someday. And it's like, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so... I think it's important to like have that discipline of like when when you when you're done with music school, but to develop it through school because yeah. you know in school you can develop that, and yeah. like having a routine, having a regimen, you know, where you're practicing a little bit, but also doing other stuff outside of music, um, is really really important. I found so yeah, yeah, brilliant. That's brilliant advice. And you know the thing and the thing that brought me uh, like brought you like to my radar were, uh, was your album uh, More Arriving, which from the concept as a concept all the way through to all the sort of bits of content that have come out around it i found it so engaging i found it in sort of potentially divisive polarizing incendiary um how did that i mean because you, you're pulling together influences from like, rappers from like mumbai and delhi spoken word there's jazz it feels like it's the, the coming together of everything that you've been learning and you know mm -hmm. absorbing what made you want to make a record like this? You know, how did you how do you approach a project like this, and how did yeah. you, how do you see it through? I think it all started. Um, this project specifically started with my interest in hip hop in India. So suddenly, right. in two thousand sixteen, I became aware of the fact that hip hop was suddenly like exploding in India to the point where like it was insane. Like wow. suddenly, you know, there's Bollywood movies about hip hop, wow. and like. I was like, what, where is this coming from? And I was trying to go back and ask my friends and be like, okay, so who, who are these kids who are making this stuff? And it turns out that predominantly hip hop in India is coming from working class neighborhoods, you know, with kids rapping in their local languages, with local producers. I met kids on, on you know, really bashed up laptops playing Fruity Loops from like 2005 licenses, you know, just samples, like making whatever they can. Yeah. And uh, there was a certain energy to that that was so infectious, you know, and it felt like it was coming from the masses for the masses, you know, because people were again rapping in local languages. So suddenly, like, so the access to this music was huge. Yeah. And it was just very exciting to see. You know, and I kind of just wanted to go and spend time with some of these rappers who I really kind of got to know and whose yeah. work I started admiring. So that's how it began. Um, so I went back to Mumbai and spent time there with a couple of rappers and like tried to check out the scene. It was young kids, you know, like 10 year old kids to like wow. 22 year old kids all just rapping and, wow. and like all have YouTube on their phones and like checking out Nas and Jay-Z and all this stuff. And I'm wow. like, man, like, you know, I didn't have this growing up because I mean, I grew up sort of pre-internet ish, not pre-internet, but before YouTube was a thing anyway, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so this was amazing. The level of access that these people have now, you know, kids have growing up, even in poorer neighborhoods is incredible. And, you know, I had a kid, uh, a 15 year old kid asked, tell me like, like, do you know who Akala is? I'm like, who the hell do you know Akala? Wow. It's like, well, so I'm like, you know, this is crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And I was so, you know, pleased at some level. I was like, wow, you know, this is the kind of, kind of cross-cultural musical, you know, exchange that I was hoping for growing up as a child and this is happening, you know? And so anyway, that's how it started. And I wanted to then have a couple of these rappers on an album because all I was hearing from India was, you know, sample beats and like sort of more basic production level mm. stuff. And I was like, okay, you know what I could do here is I could bring my jazz sensibilities, live band sensibilities and have some, you know, rappers perform on stuff that I do. That was the idea. Mm. But then it quickly became about so much more than that because it became about having one rapper from Mumbai, one from Delhi, one from Abu Dhabi. And it quickly became about kind of showcasing 
different South Asian diasporic and local Indian voices yeah. and saying that, look, growing up in Mumbai in Islam is very different to growing up in Bradford, for example. And yeah. just because two people are brown doesn't make their realities the same at all. Yeah. And so it became about featuring various different brown voices. The album yeah. became about, you know, having, like you say, spoken word from Zia Ambath, who's kind of grown up in Cricklewood here, uh, close yeah. to ICMP, to somebody, a rapper in Mumbai, who's been rapping in, you know, a 7-4 time signature, cutting, doing polyrhythms, all kind of stuff. So it just kind of grew and grew and grew the more I did it. And it just felt natural to kind of try and include as much as possible and um, it was all happening also at the time of brexit you know so there was the underlying theme of you know immigrants not being welcome and that's where the title comes from Mm. more arriving it's kind of a play on the negative rhetoric that surrounds the term you know the phrase often has a very negative connotation of Mm. people coming to steal your jobs and dilute your culture and be scared and be warned because there's more arriving, you know, and I mm. wanted to kind of play on that be like, maybe it's not such a bad thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's a very political album. It's, it's quite an angry album, I think, but it's also quite a celebratorial album because it kind of celebrates being South Asian in so many different ways as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it really so does. Mm. Yeah. So I was going to say, I mean, do you have a favorite performance from, you know, or is there a standout moment when you're making this record that you, you feel just will always stay with you? I mean, I think that one, uh, it's actually captured on the record, but I had a moment where I was in Mumbai in, in a place called Dharavi, which is uh, Asia's, I think, second largest slum. I was sitting on a balcony with these kids, uh, 15 year old kids, and he was showing me a video of James Brown. And he's like, man, James Brown, what a guy, what a dude. And this 15 year old kid, I'm like, man, you don't know, this is amazing. And I had it, I kind of had my Zoom recorder on and I kind of recorded it and they were kind of rapping and there was a couple of B-boys like break dancing to some James Brown. And I was like, this is so surreal. Yeah. <laughs> this just yeah. doesn't make any sense, but it's great. Yeah. Um, and so moments like that, I think will stick more than the actual like music on the album, because yeah. I think the music on the album is obviously like more uh, thought through and like, you know, studio time and um, the gigs have been great. You know, the gigs that the album launch gig that we did in London was great. Um, but also some of the gigs in India have been really interesting, like taking that music to India and playing for, for crowds there. Um, has been really exciting, you know. Here, what's exciting to people is the the Indianness, and then when you go to India, what's exciting is the jazzness, you know. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's always that thing of what's not yours that's exciting to a lot of people. Yeah, and as a territory to explore India, you know, it's for for the longest time for the West, it just really wasn't uh, an mm-hmm. area that you could go to and you know and perform, you know. Right. But because we live in this global village where there is. It's, it's almost like a meritocracy. If people like it, it's going to get out there. And, yeah. you know, that oh, then yeah. opens up that space. Also, it's a huge growing middle class in India. And there's a lot of money, suddenly expendable income that people are going to check out gigs. There's so much independent music. There's venues. Um, it's cheaper to travel within the country. There's a real scene between small, like places like Bangalore, Mumbai, Delhi, where musicians are traveling all the time, collaborating with each other. So it's a really growing scene. Some amazing music festivals that are happening in this in the country so you know i think um like you say global village you know there's no point restricting yourself just to play in in europe anymore there's so many yeah. other yeah. places to go and check out and play and you know experience that yeah it's good. yeah and so you know i mean so so many that's just got me thinking about so many other questions but but when you when we consider sort of like you know young musicians or students from a sort of black Asian minority ethnic background, those anyone from that sort of Bain background, is there anything like specific that you could that you might advise them if they're looking to enter the industry? Yeah, I think like what I said earlier a couple of times is that if you're from a minority background, it can feel even more lonely than it is as it is you know Mm -hmm. because there's less people who look like you in the industry there's less people there's less mentors like there's less people who you can ask for advice who look like you or the kind of sound that you might want and i struggled with that as well um but know that if you look and you keep looking you will find them they do exist and i think it's important to try and look for them Mm because i think you will find them 
And it's important also to be making the kind of music that you want to make because you think you have to have it said. Like, don't make the music that you think is going to be successful, basically. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. as especially from somebody from a minority background, you will be often pressurized to uh, talk about your minority background more than you might be comfortable talking about it. You know, mm-hmm. so often I've been asked to talk about my tabla playing or my Indianness and really expand on it and bring that to the limelight. You know, mm-hmm. whereas sometimes I'm be like, man, I've just played drums on ninety percent of this record. No one's talked about me as a drummer. You know, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. that's not the angle. That's not the narrative people want to play with. So no. I think as somebody from a minority background, you realize how important it is to control your own narrative, but equally also remember what the intention of making music always was to to say, to tell your story and not to tell a story that you think will be successful in an industry. You know? yeah. um, because if you get trapped in that, then there's no point. There's no, you know. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. I mean, that actually, that's a whole new way of thinking about like training yourself for like, for the media spotlight, you know, it's mm. often it's for the longest time. It was, you know, here are the things we should talk about. Here are the things we shouldn't talk about. Um, and now it's, we, we realize that, you know, people like, you know, people want truth. People want Absolutely. something that's going to resonate with them and that they can see, you know, in your eyes that when you're talking to them, it's coming from a sincere place. And now more so than ever, young people around the world, they need, as you say, as you, you know, quite rightly say, people who l- actually just look like them doing the things that they want to do because otherwise we just have the same old idols, you know? Yeah. And that's how you get a whole generation of people in the 70s, 80s and 90s who wanted to be uh, like John Lennon, but not be John Lennon, but actually ended up just copying John Lennon, becoming like John Lennon. And they might have been a black kid or a brown kid or, you yeah. know, whatever. Yeah. And when we have people like you, we have other artists who are out there, you know, in a kind of, in a very, in their own lane, Mm. doing their own thing their way suddenly it opens up for everyone exactly and i think it's it's a far more interesting industry to be part of anyway because then you have people telling different stories from different places Mm. and not everyone's just banging on about the same thing Mm. which is great you know it's like having variety in the kind of books you read or the kind of music you want to listen to it's always great to have that and maybe your music's not for everyone and that's fine you know, you make music for people and you, you will find people who resonate with it. You know, like mm. you say, truth is so important and is, is kind of what most people engage with. Ultimately, you see the most engagement from people who are just telling an honest story, mm. you know, not from people who just are saying the same thing that a million other people are saying. So, yeah, I think it's really important to kind of remember that, especially in times when things seem tough. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And it's a way to maintain your own sanity, really, in this industry that can be so competitive. But just mm-hmm. remembering that you have a voice and that voice is really important and it's unique to you and it's uh, there's a space for it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, what's, what's, what's coming up next for you? What's, what's happening over the next few weeks, next few months or the rest of the year, given everything that's happening? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, like everyone else in the industry, I mean, you've had gigs cancelled all the way up to the end of the year. Mm. Um, we're supposed to have a gig uh, on the 16th of November. I have no idea whether that's actually going to happen. Uh, but it's at Village Underground. So that would be a really fun gig to do if we, if we end up doing it. But who knows? Um, I'm putting out an EP of music that um, I recorded around the same time I recorded More Arriving and it's called mm-hmm. Otherland. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's songs that didn't quite make it onto More Arriving just because they didn't fit the theme of the album, but equally mm-hmm. songs that I, I really love and I think are really good songs. So I'm putting them out on an EP with some remixes right. and um, got a couple other releases happening, but I'm really enjoying my time right now, just trying to be productive in my studio, home studio and kind of just working on the next thing, the next album without really thinking about it too much, but just creating, just making yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, and it's been so long since I've done that, just kind of making even 30% tracks, just sketches, making a sketch, leaving it, going somewhere else, being a bit haphazard with it. But in a way, there's such creative freedom and excitement to the, doing that that I haven't done in so long. Yeah. Um, where deadlines have been, you know, end of Friday, I need a final mix. I don't have that right now. So I'm mm. trying to enjoy that kind of like lack of deadlines and just work on, 
you know, I'm working on maybe seven or eight tracks at the same time. Yeah. Maybe not even going very far with them, but actually it's still enjoyable right now. So that's so refreshing to hear that because some, again, I think a lot of people when they're listening to, you know, established artists talking, they're always expecting them to say, you know, that they're, they're, they're deep in the trenches and they're doing this huge magnum opus. And actually it's really refreshing to be like, I'm just doing a bit of this, bit of that, you know. Yeah, no, I'm kind of directionless at the moment and it's, I'm, I'm just loving it because I, so much of my life uh, as a freelancer is also, you know, trying to have a direction and trying to be very disciplined about something, trying to set deadlines. And you, yeah. know, you often, it's like that fine balance we talked about before, it's like of having that discipline but not losing the joy of music and often yeah. when you have deadlines you lose that joy and it just becomes about finishing a piece of work yeah uh, whereas yeah. right now i'm trying to just <clears throat> make music and just just enjoy it for a while you know yeah so it's lovely it's really refreshing to hear and if people want to get in touch with you if there are other young artists out there mm-hmm. who want to maybe you know potentially collaborate or do a remix of your work um or just want to connect with you you know what's the best way that other artists and other you know students can 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 get to know you better online yeah absolutely i mean i'm really uh, i'd love to hear from people young students as well who want to you know who would ever want to have a chat about anything you know or if they're struggling with something or just need some advice or whatever I'm, i'd love to chat uh the best way is just through email so it would be uh info info at uh, my whole name so sarthikorwar.com so info at sarthikorwar.com um, that's the email address um become straight to me so yeah i'd love to and i'm local i'm very local to icmp so i'm quite happy to meet for a coffee you know one coffee shop's open i guess they're open now actually yeah yeah so yeah i think you know that's oh, th- th- thank you for sharing that because i know that sometimes that could be that could, that might be a bit overwhelming <laughs> suddenly receiving loads of <laughs> like contact from people um but and when things open up and you know when th- at ICMP when sort of uh, you know when the doors are open fully again it would be amazing to have you to come in and uh, you know like deliver a masterclass or, or perhaps we could do this in a room mm. with some with some people as well that would be amazing uh, and just extend the conversation I think there are so many people who are from sort of you know non traditional sort of uh, heritage backgrounds um, who would gain a lot of confidence and a lot of encouragement hearing you talk about your work and how you started and, and the kind of like trajectory of like what you've done. Mm. Um, so really appreciate your time. Oh no, thanks a lot. No, that would be great. I would love to do some playing as well. Uh, yes. With, yeah. With the, with the students. I think that would be fun. And yeah, they, uh, they would no, love thanks that. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it.